Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Southern Methodist University, and thank you for joining us for tonight's lectures. Tonight's public lecture kicks off the International Deep and Elastic Scattering Conference. There's over 250 physicists here from 30 countries here at SMU. I'm Matthew Bremer. And I'm Maisha McKee. We're both senior physics majors here at SMU, and we're glad to be your hosts tonight. Um, so we have four short lectures in which we will learn about a question that each speaker believes is important for physics to address in the coming decades. Please feel free to take pictures, videos, and share any of this on social media. We'll save all questions until after the event, and speakers will be available in the hall outside for questions that you may have after the program. Our first speaker is Dr. Joseph Eisen from the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Eisen is the principal investigator for the UTD High Energy Physics Group. His work has covered a variety of experiments, including ATLAS at CERN in Switzerland, and the Babar at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, and the Beijing Spectrometer. In addition, he plays the banjo for a band called Squirrel Heads and Gravy, and two of his songs are on the Resonance album, featuring songs from members of the ATLAS collaboration. Today, he will be talking about the quest to seek dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Joseph Eisen to the stage. Thanks, guys. Um, great. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, hunting uh, dark matter uh, at colliders and uh, this is an area where particle physics got informed by astronomy and astrophysics and I was pulling out pictures of um, <coughs> excuse me, with my telescope and I realized hmm, uh, uh, Steve Sekula who will be speaking later had some old family pictures so I went back into the archives and I found a picture of my telescope when it was new. How many of you have something which is 40 years old still that you can still use? Uh, for me, that's my telescope. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to be speaking about the the universe and dark matter, and so here's a history of the universe. Um, and the uh, the Big Bang happens here, and in the first fraction of a second, we go through all the things you hear about uh, quantum gravity and string theory and grand unifying theories as the universe quickly uh, cooled and expanded and went through a period of rapid growth that we call the period of inflation. And after the period of inflation, things are starting to get more like we're used to in our current universe, uh, because things are cooling down. Um, in the early universe, all of the four forces that we know about, gravity, the weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, um, we're all about the same strength when they're hitting particles that are moving very, very fast. Um, but as things slow down, first gravity throws out and became weaker, and uh, then the strong force separated from the electroweak force. And by the time we're um, uh, fully, more or less fully expanded, it's going to be. Uh, uh, the universe is filled with quarks and gluons in what's called the quark-gluon plasma, sort of a soup, and then that cooled down, and protons and neutrons started to form, and right at the edge here, where it says afterglow, that was a very important event in the history of the universe. That's when electrons were grabbed up by protons, and atoms formed. And that's the beginning of the Dark Ages, a period of about 400 million years when there wasn't any life in the universe except the little leftover pangs of light that the electrons gave off as they fell into the protons to form atoms. Um, and there was a little bit of UV light, and that was all there was in the universe for just about 400 million years. It was a very dark, faceless, very uniform, but not perfectly uniform place. And uh, so the atoms uh, uh, were about 
12% of the universe back then. And, the, um, and that ultraviolet light eventually would, would be called the cosmic microwave background, because as the universe expanded, everyone seems to be moving away from the atoms and gave them off, and they're now microwaves. And that's when you hear the cosmic microwave background. That's where it came from. But there's something else in the universe back then, which is overwhelmingly the single largest constituent, this dark matter. Why is it called dark? Well, in order to see something, you have to be able to shine light on it, and the light has to be reflected. But dark matter has no electric charge, so it doesn't reflect light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't scatter light. It's as transparent as you get. You can't see it. Um, and it has no color or strong charge, a force that, uh, which is what it would need to be attracted by the force that holds protons and neutrons and nuclei together. So basically, it's not there. It behaves, in a sense, like the neutrinos that we know. Uh, and the one thing we know about dark matter, the way we know about it, is that it does have mass, and that's important. Uh, and all of this dark matter was left all throughout the universe, but there were places in the universe which were denser, the remnants of quantum fluctuations during this period of expansion. And dark matter started to coalesce, it started to fall to places where there was a little bit more density than elsewhere. And it fell, and it fell uh, inexorably. <coughs> Um, oh, by the way, this is how we know that the, uh, the background was not uniform. This is the microwave background as we see it today. And if you look at the scale, it's very, very minute variations in the temperature of the microwave background is what's represented by these colors, <coughs> slightly different colors, on this globe of the sky. And so, this is a snapshot of those primordial quantum fluctuations that the dark matter fell to. And so for over 400 million years, dark matter fell and it gravitated and it coalesced. And when the dark matter gathered, some of the ordinary matter, the hydrogen and helium gathered. And the clouds became denser until the nuclear furnaces turned on. And this is not the early universe. This, these are modern pictures of areas in the sky where new stars are being formed from molecular clouds. And this is something like what the early universe must have looked like. After 400 million years of being barren, it was now a beautiful, spectacular place. And not only did stars form, there were galaxies forming. Uh, this is a region of a uh, galaxy where there's a lot of new star formation help that color. But, uh, um, and so if you look at where the galaxies formed, now this is, a, we can look back into the sky, this is from the Sloan Digital Sky, sky Survey, you can see that there's a pattern that the universe um, isn't uniform, matter condensed wherever there have been quantum fluctuations. And so this is the sky as we see it, looking out, actually slices of the sky, because we haven't done the whole sky. It's going to be a while. And so that was the role of dark matter in attracting visible matter. And that was where things were. And then it just went into hiding and lurked for 13 billion years, until 1933, when a Swiss physicist named Fritz Zwicky um, was doing an exercise. He was looking at a cluster called the Coma cluster in Coma Veronese. If any of you are amateur astronomers, you know where it is. And um, he was looking at the cluster, and he was doing going through an exercise that uh, I, I know there are at least a few physics students in the audience. Uh, he was the, he was applying the burial theorem to the Coma Veronese, and it, if you measure the velocities of the particles, it should tell you the mass of the cluster. Well, he got the wrong answer by a lot. Um, and 
the answer, I shouldn't say the wrong answer, he actually got the right answer, it was just not the answer that anyone expected. And he was sort of a curmudgeon, and people sort of, ah, he did something wrong, and that result can't be right, and life went on. Um, and then in the, um, in the 70s, another physicist named Vera Rubin um, set out to measure the speeds of stars orbiting about galaxies. And, uh, and so this is done, uh, for those of you who have ever heard an ambulance go by, you know the high pitch going to a low pitched sound. That's a Doppler shift, and it works with light as well. And so you put your spectrograph across um, an edge on galaxy, and you can see the shift in the frequency of the light, and that tells you whether stars are coming to you or away from you, and how, or, and how fast. And when uh, Vera Rubin, well, what everyone was expecting um, is something like we see in the solar system, where you have a sun in the center, and then the speed falls off um, with distance. Well, that's what everyone expected. You'd expect to see something like that for a galaxy, too, because there's that bulge in the center where all the mass, a lot of the mass of the galaxy is. But that's not what they were found. I mean, the speed gets faster as you get further from the center. And this was a head scratcher, but it wasn't a mistake because the same result happens for all galaxies. And so that's suggesting, hey, we're missing a lot of the mass. There's some mass, but we know where the stars are, we know what the gas is, there must be something else. Um, and by the way, it's not just it, this happens in the Milky Way, too. The Milky Way is just like the other galaxies. So, notice anything strange um, in this picture? Um, oh, look. See that? Those funny shapes? That's gravitational lensing. Um, and it's another way to measure the mass of a cluster. This is a cluster of galaxies, and you see that um, the, the sh whoops, these shapes. Are, are a way to measure where the, there's mass in the galaxy. And when we do, we see this cluster has this funny ring of mass. And we believe that's because there was a collision of clusters of galaxies. Uh, and as the animations show, when you have clusters colliding, it separates out the dark matter from the visible matter. And so we can see the clusters of galaxies, these yellow things in the center, but here's this mostly halo of dark matter. So dark matter is real. Can we make it in an accelerator? Because I am an experimental physicist. And so, um, whoops. So we have a clue from a bunch of satellite experiments as to how we might make dark matter. Because uh, when, we, when we were looking at the cosmic ray spectra and looking at anti-electrons, positrons, we were, um, the expectation was that as you go to higher and higher energies, you'd see fewer and fewer. But when we get up to higher energies, the number of positrons, a fraction of positrons, increases. And that's a, another head scratcher. Is that a clue? Because positrons don't get very far. They're antimatter. So they have to be made locally. So how, what's a local source of antimatter? Um, well, um, antimatter, uh, high energy gamma rays have the property that um, they can uh, pass near matter and convert into an electron positron pair. And um, some, some theorists suggested that perhaps amongst dark matter particles, there's a force between dark matter particles that has a photon-like equivalent that somehow can mix. It's all speculative, but uh, this is what physics is like at the edge of what we don't know. Um, if that dark photon turned into an ordinary photon, it would have a signature of an electron positron pair or heavy cousins. And that's the signature my group 
a DT Dallas has been looking for a large hadron collider. Now, you would have, uh, the short answer is we have not seen them so far, we have looked. If we had seen them, I wouldn't be talking to you, I'd be talking to an audience in Stockholm. But, uh, uh, in any event, we're about to run the LAC again. We're going to come back on with a higher beam energy and an improved detector, and hopefully you'll be reading about discovery before too long. Well. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Eisen. Our next speaker is Dr. Pat Skubik from the University of Oklahoma. He also conducts research using the ALICE experiment at CERN. He has interests in experimental elementary particle physics at the energy frontier, proton collisions, and the development of semiconductor detectors in high energy physics experiments. He has made several contributions to creating these semiconductor detectors. Dr. Skubik will tell us more about the search for deeper symmetries in nature than those already discovered. Please welcome Dr. Skubik. Thank you very much for the introduction. Is the microphone working? Hopefully it is. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, so I've been asking myself the question, if the universe is the answer, what is the question? The question I've been asking myself is, is there physics beyond the standard model? And that's similar to Joe's question. So if we... Um, And move the slide. Okay. So the standard model has particles that are part of it, uh, particles that make up matter, which are the quarks and the leptons on the left, and particles that mediate the forces, like the photon blue line, W and Z, and of course the Higgs we now believe exists, and it um, provides the other particles with masses. So these are the particles that make up all the matter that's familiar to us in everyday life, and we have atoms, molecules, of course the proton, we believe consists of three billion quarks, and uh, blue ones holding uh, those quarks together, and then the proton combines with other nucleons to make up nuclei. So how do we study these particles? Well, we smash them together and we study the debris that comes off from the collisions. And actually the proton is a little bit like a car because it's fairly complicated. It has these quarks and gluons in it. And so when we smash them together, which we do at the LHC, we smash protons together, we see fairly complicated events, which contain a lot of debris, some of which may not be interesting, some of which may be interesting. So that's what the field of energy physics is all about. So what can we conclude about the Higgs that we just discovered? Well, first of all, we know its mass quite well, a little over 125 GeV. All the cross sections that we've measured are consistent with standard model expectations. So it appears to be exactly the state that the standard model predicted. Of course, we'll be studying it much more in the, the new run as it starts the summer. But while the standard model is quite successful, it has important limitations. First of all, in my mind, the biggest limitation is it doesn't include gravity whatsoever. So there's also no candidate for the dark matter that Joe was talking about. And another technical problem is that the Higgs mass would not be stable due to virtual quantum corrections as indicated by the diagrams here. So uh, I think it's a bit embarrassing that we don't have the quantum theory of gravity. We have a classical theory of gravity, and that's been known for 100 years. In fact, this is the 100th anniversary of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And we know gravity exists. If I step off the stage, I know I'm not going to be moving in a straight line, which um, just got covered up here by this um, 
picture from Science Magazine. Instead, space-time is going to be warped by the presence of the Earth, and I'll be moving in the direction of the Earth when I, if I step off the stage. So how can we incorporate gravity into our theories? Well, fortunately, several decades ago, an extension to the symmetries that underlie relativity theory was discovered. And this is called supersymmetry, or SUSY for short. And this requires a symmetry between the matter particles and the force particles. So for every particle in the standard model, there should be a supersymmetric partner. And after uh, putting those super partners in, then the bad quantum corrections I mentioned cancel and are no longer a problem. So if this is true, for every particle in the standard model, there will be a supersymmetric partner. And we give these supersymmetric partners names. We put an S in front of the name of the particle if it's a matter particle, so that squirk, a squirk superpartner would be a squirk. A squirk superpartner would be a squirk. And then if it's a force particle, we put an eno at the end of the name, so the superpartner of the photon would be a photino. And the superpartner of a Higgs would be a Higgsino. But nevertheless, if this theory is correct, all these particles should be um, out there in nature. And what does the Higgs mass tell us about um, supersymmetry? It turns out that for supersymmetry to be viable, there's a fairly narrow mass range where the Higgs boson can lie. And it turns out that it does lie in that narrow mass region labeled MSSM. Whereas if you just take into account the standard model by itself, the range of possible Higgs masses could be much uh, wider. So maybe this is a clue that we're on the right track thinking about supersymmetry. Well, once we specify the parameters of the theory, we can calculate exactly how these particles will behave and how they will interact with other particles and how they will look in our experiments. So here is a simulated SUSY event and how it would look in the Atlas detector. So we have charged tracks that leave tracks in the tracking system. We have lots of energy deposited in the outer parts of the detector, indicated by these yellow bars, which are proportional to the energy deposited. So this is the beam's eye view. This is the beam is coming right into the page, right in the center of the detector. So that's the beam's eye view of the event. If you look at it from the side, it looks like this. And here we see we have some muons coming out into the outer muon system and lots of energy deposited in the calorimeters. So we can compare our data to the events predicted by the standard model. And if we see any excess, we can use these simulations to uh, determine whether SUSY uh, particles are the excess. And um, our group at Oklahoma, our theory group, has been, have been pioneers in developing the code necessary to make these displays. So, so far we've looked. We've looked uh, very hard uh, for these extra particles, and so far we haven't seen them. So is that a crisis? Or could there be an explanation for why we haven't seen them yet? Well, it turns out there are a couple possible explanations. One is that we just have enough energy to produce these super partners, and that um, we would need a bigger accelerator. Or it could also be possible that the particles decay in such a way that they don't leave signals in the detector. We expect that the lowest mass supersymmetric particle would probably be stable. And it would leave the detector without leaving any uh, trace. So that particle would be an excellent candidate for the dark matter that Joe was talking about. But if the particles have a spectrum so that the, the, the particles that are slightly higher in mass than the lid, then the smallest mass one might uh, leave very little energy in the detector if the mass is very similar. So those are two possible explanations. And in fact, to take into account the value of the Higgs mass, actually a spectrum that looks like this is actually quite possible. And here we have uh, low mass superpartners, around 100 GeV or so, that have very similar masses to each other. The Higgs and Higgs Enos, for example, might decay into just dark matter without leaving any real signal in the detector. 
Now we may be able to see some of these higher mass states if they exist maybe around a TeV or so of mass, but we probably will not, will not see the we will not see the particles up here at the higher masses because they're simply too heavy to be made in the LHC. So what are the future prospects? Well, we have, um, as I said, may, may not be able to discover supersymmetry at the LHC, and it will not cover all the parameter space, so it could still be out there even if we don't discover it. I'm, I actually, ironically, the averted super collider that was under construction right down the road in Texas here um, would have had a lot more energy than the LHC and would have covered a lot more of the parameter space. We would love to have that machine today. But maybe we can make other new machines if we don't see anything. One possibility would be to build a machine with electron positrons as the colliding particles, and they would be more clean events and they would possibly be able to detect these uh, low mass, oops, sorry, these low mass particles um, that I mentioned that we could have, uh, maybe are not seen at the LHC because of the compressed spectrum. So there's a proposal out to build such a machine. In, and actually, Japan is very interested in, in hosting it. It would have an energy between 250 and 1,000 GeV. It's called the International Linear Collider, or ILC. And it would have, as I said, cleaner events where you could detect these compressed Higginos. So the Japanese are considering it. It costs about $10 billion, so contributions will be needed from other countries, including the United States. Here's a, an example of what an event would look like. Chargino event at the LHC. This was provided to me by my theory colleagues. And you can see the topology of the event is relatively simple. And then on the right, we see the uh, LHC traveling on its way to a Japanese city and looking very much like a bullet train. So in summary, if supersymmetry is discovered, it would gain um, and move us to the next level in understanding the unification of the laws of physics. It would provide a dark matter candidate. It would also be an avenue to include gravity in our theories and maybe a window to superstring theory. And the immediate crisis would be averted. And here is a picture of a quote unquote golden Susie event as seen by the Atlas detector. Okay, I'd like to thank the other members of our group for contributions uh, to this talk, in particular the theory members, um, Boris Akil-Kainak, Howie Bear, who's in the audience, and Chung Gao. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Skubik. Our next speaker is Dr. Chris Jackson from the University of Texas at Arlington. Dr. Jackson specializes in theoretical high-energy physics. He has been the lead author on several publications regarding the precise predictions of Higgs boson production rates at the LHC. This will help us understand the complete nature of the newly discovered particle. In addition, he has developed novel ideas concerning dark matter. Today, he will talk about dark matter and how particles from space can help us figure out what dark matter is. Let's welcome Dr. Jackson to the stage. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So thank you. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, like uh, my, uh, like the introduction said, I'm a theorist, so I'm kind of like the uh, you know the thing on the Sesame Street. I'm the one that's not like the others. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I come from a different point of view. Some might say a totally alternate reality. Uh, when I look at physics, when I look at dark matter. Uh, but I hope to uh, give you an idea of the things that we think about as theorists and, and you know, some new exciting ways that we're looking at to detect dark matter, okay? So I have to thank Joe and Pat for a, uh, a very nice introduction to my talk. And so my, my slides are gonna kind of seem like maybe, you know, uh, dark matter for dummies or the idiot's guide to dark matter, but uh, that's what they are, okay? 
So what I spend most of my time about, uh, was what I most spend most of my time doing is trying to, you know, think, uh, what is dark matter? All right? And most of the time I'm scratching my head. Sometimes I'm banging my head against my desk. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is I can't tell you what it is, right? But I can tell you what it ain't, right? And uh, so this comes from uh, measurements that Joe was talking about, so things like uh, uh, gravitational lensing and things. So you, you know, you're asking the question, what can dark matter be, right? And the most logical thing would be, it's gotta be something big, it's gotta be something that we know, right? So such as uh, brown dwarf stars, so things, you know, like big Jupiters, uh, neutron stars, or maybe Gargantua from, uh, uh, from the uh, interstellar movie, right? So uh, giant black holes. But we know from these uh, gravitational measurements, gravitational lensing measurements, that, that these things are there. We know they're there, but there's just not enough of them to make up what we, you know, uh, what makes up about 20% of the universe, right? And this stuff goes by the acronym of uh, massive compact halo objects or machos. And uh, so the next question you could ask, you know, after this is, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's nothing, maybe it's not something big, maybe we've screwed up, or we don't understand the laws of gravity, right, to explain these uh, gravity, these uh, rotational curves and things like that. It turns out that that is not true. We've shot that down, those ideas. Those are called modified Newtonian dynamics. So those alternate theories of gravity are gone, right? And everything we have now seems to point towards dark matter being a particle. Okay, and you guys have seen this, this picture a couple times. This, these are the particles that we know about. These are the standard model. This is like your uh, periodic table of particles, if you will. All right? And everything uh, that we know of is made up of all this stuff, except dark, dark matter and uh, maybe dark energy. Right? And everything in this room is basically made up of this first column. Okay? So the ups and downs, quarks, make up the protons and neutrons, and the electrons, obviously, are ever present. But, so you ask yourself, well, you know, if, if these are the particles we know about, could dark matter be one of these guys? And as Joe uh, highlighted, we know that dark matter is electrically neutral, right? So it doesn't interact with light, otherwise we would see it. It's not weak, uh, it is weakly interacting. It doesn't interact in, through any other strong force because uh, if it did, we would have detected it. Right? So we hope that it's weakly interacting. That's kind of the hope of theorists. And <clears throat> the other thing is that it's extremely long-lived. So as I pointed out earlier, the dark matter, you know, the abundance of dark matter that we had was born in the Big Bang, so nearly 14 billion years ago. Right? And it turns out that when you, you know, uh, use these three characteristics or these three constraints, that nothing in the standard model can play the role of dark matter. Right? The closest you can come are the neutrinos, uh, because they're extremely long-lived, weakly interacting, weakly interacting, and electrically neutral, but they are ultra-relativistic. They're moving at very high speeds, and so you can't get these beautiful pictures of uh, these large-scale structures. So you don't have time in the universe for for the um, uh, for neutrinos to ask, act as your kind of gravitational wells. So that all points to a new particle, right? And you say, well, okay, so that's a new particle. We have to go what's called beyond the standard model. And you say, okay, well, are there theories of you know, dark matter? Can we come up with theories? And the answer is, oh yeah, okay? <laughs> so the good thing about uh, uh, high energy physics for, uh, for theorists is that these experiments take years and years and years to build. They take years and years and years to run. They take years and years and years to analyze the data. And that gives theorists uh, you know, just you know, sitting in Starbucks somewhere uh, down in uh, espressos with a with a laptop to come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. Okay. The bad news or the good news, depending on your point of view, uh, bad it might be bad news for some experimentalists, is that we can come up with a whole uh, boatload of theories. Right, and th this is just a cartoon showing a bunch of different theories and you know, maybe like the Venn diagram from hell, but uh, <laughs> it shows this, this kind of pink overlap region here is showing that all these different models basically lead to the same types of signals, right? And so you ask, well, if we could discover it, how are we gonna tell them apart, 
Well, we're going to push that question under the rug because the first thing we want to know is can we detect it, right? That's what we want to start out with. And the one thing we know for sure is that it's everywhere, okay? And Joe showed a similar picture to this. This is from theoretical um, simulations. Uh, but they, you see these large, these are what they call large scale structures. So this is on the scale of the universe and these are you know, clusters of galaxies and, and they form these filaments and voids and all kinds of stuff, okay? But the important point is dark matter is everywhere, even in this room, right? And so you say, well, wait a minute, dark matter is in this room, why can't I feel it, right? And it turns out that dark matter, there's billions of dark matter particles passing through your body every second, every second, right? But it's so weakly interacting that it just goes right through you. Right? So you're sitting in this cloud of dark matter and it's just going right through you. Well, uh, some people did a study based on some experimental constraints on dark matter. And they did a calculation to see how many dark matter particles actually interact with the nuclei in your body. And it turns out that you know, that number is typically on the order of a few. So you get a few dark matter scatterings off of your nuclei every year. Right? But it could be, you know, in a more uh, optimistic uh, scenario, it could be up to, you know, 1,000, maybe 10,000. But the important point is you don't have to worry about dark matter radiation, like you don't have to worry about turning into a fantastic four uh, from these cosmic rays, you know, these dark cosmic rays or anything like that. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we can try to produce it like Joe and Pat, right? Or we can uh, use the fact that dark matter is all around us, right? And that's the idea of these experiments uh, that they put underground and they just wait, right? They put those things down there. And Dr. Cooley, where is she? I'm way back here now. Way back there, <laughs> right? Is an expert on these that are direct detection experiments. Uh, so they put uh, a detector underground, they just wait for dark matter to come in and scatter off of their detector, right? Um, or the third, the third possibility is you look to the sky, right? And you look to the sky where you expect there to be a lot of dark matter. Because it's weakly interacting, you don't want to try to look in this room, right? Because you'll just be waiting forever. So you look in places where there are very strong gravitational wells, right? Where gravity is very strong. And so one example might be the center of the Milky Way, right? So there's a lot of matter there. There's a supermassive black hole there. So there's a lot of gravity, right? And so you would expect a lot of dark matter to, you know, fall into this well. And if there's a lot of dark matter, that means the density is high, right? And there's a higher probability of dark matter to scatter off of each other. And if it can scatter off of each other, there's a possibility of signals. Okay? Uh, and not only, you don't have to look as far as uh, the center of the galaxy, you can also look closer to home. So uh, the sun is obviously... Uh, a strong um, uh, uh, gravity, uh, gravitational potential, or gravitational well. So you could expect some dark matter to, uh, <coughs> to accumulate in the center of the, of the sun. And you could actually you know, imagine scenarios where dark matter gets caught up, into, and caught up in the gravitational well of the Earth. Right? So what do we look for? We look, we're looking at these places where there's a lot of dark matter, we look for dark matter annihilations. Okay, it sounds sounds cool, right? But what is it? So it's like Pat was saying that every particle uh, has its antiparticle, right? And uh, so you apply the same ideas to dark matter, and so you look for these types of events. So you have a lot of dark matter; it's really packed in. So there's a higher probability uh, that it will interact. And if it has its own antiparticle, or if it has an antiparticle, it can annihilate. Right? And so you're using E equals MC squared, right? but in reverse. So these guys are just sitting out there, and you convert their mass, <coughs> excuse me, convert their mass into energy. Right? And that energy can be converted into the mass of lighter objects, like the objects that we know of, like the leptons, the quarks, and, and uh, bosons, and energy. So these guys will be boosted, they'll be given a lot of energy, and so they can make their way to our detector. Uh, just a funny story because they pointed out that Howie Bear is in the audience and Howie uh, was my, uh, I went to grad school at Florida State and Howie taught me everything I know about quantum field theory. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in your first semester of, uh, of grad school they make you go to the colloquia, uh, the talks, the departmental talks. And so the very first one I think I went to, Howie was giving a talk 
And he was talking about supersymmetry. He's one of the world, you know, one of the world's leading experts. And he was talking about selectrons and smuons and all this stuff. And I had no idea. I didn't know I wanted to go into particle physics. But he was talking about smuons and spotums and stuff. And all I could think was, wow, this guy has a really bad lisp. <laughs> but little, <laughs> little did I know that I would go into this field and, and you know, I would be the one saying smuons and selectrons. Anyways. So we're looking for dark matter annihilations, right? How do we look for them? Well, we can look for uh, gamma rays, high energy photons. And the way we do that is, so if dark matter is annihilating and annihilates into uh, the photons out here, these wiggly lines, right? Those would occur, say, at the center of the galaxy, and they make, our, they make their way here, and we would detect them in space with this uh, Fermi gamma ray telescope. Okay, so these are, this is one of the ongoing uh, experiments looking for uh, of, of, of many things, it's looking for dark matter annihilations. Right? And you say, well, what did it look like? Well, this is what, uh, this is a picture from the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope that shows the plane of the Milky Way in gamma rays. Right? And you can see it's mainly uh, 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 located in the, in, the, in the plane of the galaxy. Right? And you see these little dots here and there. Those are uh, neutron stars and, and things like that. But you're hoping to see that you know, once you subtract off the normal astrophysics, you might see some signature of dark matter annihilations. Uh, the other uh, experiment uh, that I really like that I think is really cool is an, is an uh, experiment called Ice Cube. And this is, a, this is an actual picture of it. It's not the rebel base on Hoth, uh, uh, even though it looks like it. But this is a really cool experiment that Dr. Cooley also worked on. And what they do is they take, uh, so they're in Antar Antar Antarctica, right? And they drill down using these hot water drills, and they sink these detectors, these strings of detectors down in the ice. And so they use the ice cap as uh, the detector itself, right? And so what they look for are signatures of uh, neutrinos that coming from different sources, but one of them is a uh, possibility coming from dark matter. Right, and so this is a picture of an actual event, oops, an actual event passing through uh, these strings here. And so you can see the little circles are uh, the detectors themselves uh, firing off. Okay? So we hope to see something like that coming from either the sun or some cosmic source. Okay? And so I just want to end with <laughs> just a statement. Because uh, you know, when, the, when the Higgs was uh, uh, announced that it was discovered, a lot of the media made it sound like, that's it, particle physics is done, you know, fold it up, let's go home. And it's not, okay? The discovery of the Higgs is just the beginning, right? It's just the tip of the, of the proverbial, uh, proverbial uh, 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 iceberg, right? So we all, we, now we, we know kind of a complete picture of the 5% the of the matter that we can see, but there's all this stuff uh, beneath the surface that we hope to uh, discover and study in the next few years. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Jan Jackson. I always wondered why the ice cube experiment was in Antarctica. What did you think, Matt? I think it's amazing dark matter particles are passing through us every second. <laughs> Too bad they don't taste like chocolate. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Dr. Steven Sekulo from here at SMU. He's also my research mentor, research mentor here, so it's a great pleasure to introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Skula has studied the quantum numbers of the Higgs boson and um, contributed to searches for additional Higgs bosons like the charged Higgs. He's also interested in dark matter and is an award-winning teacher here at SMU. He's also a leader in the Higgs experimental physics community. Today he will talk about his journey to understand forces and particles at the beginning of time. Please welcome Dr. Skula. So one of the things that's very important to me is family. And you can think of family quite narrowly in terms of the people that you may go home to at the end of the day or the people you hang out with at family reunions or holiday feasts at various times of the year. But I'd like to be a little bit more inclusive than that. And if you think about all of us tonight, we're all part of this shared human family with a lineage going back hundreds of thousands of years to all the ancestor humans that came before us. In a much wider sense, we're part of a great cosmic family. The atoms that make up our bodies are made from particles 
that have essentially been with us in one form or another since the beginning of time, 13.7 billion years ago. And so the theme of my presentation tonight is to think about the journey that physicists take through the cosmos by asking it questions and then having the hubris to expect answers back by doing experiments. Uh, to sort of get back to family photos of the cosmos at the beginning of time so that we can better understand ourselves now uh, and in the past and maybe understand something about where we're going in the future. So this is Jacob Haskell Thompson. Uh, I knew him as Papa. This was my grandfather on my mother's side. And you can see a picture of him crouching in his basement workshop in his home in Maryland. He was a World War II veteran. Uh, he never much talked about that part of his life until far later in life. But he was also an engineer by trade. And when he retired, he was an electrician and used that basement shop quite a bit more. Now that shop was full of dangerous toys that I was not allowed to play with. And I could never go into that basement shop unsupervised. And so for me, it was a place that was important to pop up. But I didn't really understand that place. All I knew was that mom and dad didn't want me going down there and playing when no one was around. Well, I came home from school one day in 1990. And my parents were waiting for me at the end of the driveway, not 10 feet from where this photograph uh, of me and pop up was taken when I was very young. And they told me the news that he had died that morning very suddenly, died at the breakfast table, basically of a stroke. It was a shocking death. Nobody expected Pop Up to be the first grandparent to die in the family. He seemed to be the most vibrant, the most healthy, the most everything. And so the family, in the wake of this terrible news, was essentially crushed to the point of not supervising the children in the family. And so in the weeks and months after Pop Up's death, I spent a lot more time wandering down into that basement workshop with all of its dangerous toys. And nobody seemed to much mind anymore. And that shop is, in fact, still there today, where my grandmother still lives. Uh, essentially, the way it was when he died, after my father did some tidying up and organized it a little bit after the funeral. I found myself spending a lot more time in that basement shop. I burned myself once, and I electrocuted myself twice. <laughs> And by doing things like that, by getting my hands into radios and other gadgets that Pop-Up had in the basement, I learned to not only take them apart, but lose my fear of putting them back together and worrying that they wouldn't work anymore. I found you could put them back together and they would still work, and sometimes they were broken and you could fix them. So even though I didn't get to know Pop-Up all that well in life, I was only a freshman in high school when he died, in his death, I spent more time in a place that was important to him to try to get closer to him, to try to learn more about pop-up and family photos and an old album to tell me. And in doing that, I lost my fear of tinkering with the cosmos. And in part, in death, pop-up made me into the experimental scientist that I am today. And so while he didn't live to see me graduate from high school or college or earn my PhD or get my faculty position at SMU, he was instrumental in me becoming the scientist that I am today. And much as we can learn about a family member from photos and then interacting with members of our family to learn more about them, we can also ask questions of the cosmos by using experimental science and try to get answers back about what the cosmos was like when it was very young. So if you imagine that 13.7 billion years ago, when no human beings were around, there was this moment where the universe came into being. You would really like to know something about that moment in time. I mean, after all, everything that happened from that moment onward influenced everything in the cosmos and where we are today, who we are now, and what the fate of this universe ultimately is. So by gathering information about the past, we can gain not only wisdom, but also the ability to control the world around us and understand it a little bit better, maybe lose a little bit of that fear that we have about the universe. So the question that gets me up every day, and coming into the office with all the stuff that is associated with an office job, all the stuff you, you don't like, uh, but because of the kernel of the thing you do like, the kernel of the thing I do like is the question. And it's the question that's been on my mind since 1991, when I realized that I had a love of physics. And that is simply, what were the building blocks and the forces that were present at or near the beginning of time that ruled the cosmos? And right now, from my perspective as an experimental physicist working on uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and especially working with the Higgs boson, which is newly discovered, I am particularly interested in understanding what the Higgs boson can tell us about a moment in time that's maybe 
400 millionths of a millionth of a second after the beginning of time. So to do this, to study particles that were around and playing big roles near the beginning of the cosmos, but which are very hard to see now and to see the role that they play in our lives now, you have to have a machine. And the machine that's been mentioned time and time again here tonight is the Large Hadron Collider. There is no such thing as a time machine, at least not yet. And so we can't hop in a time machine and try to go back and see what those first moments of time were actually like. But we can recreate them in miniature. And so the Large Hadron Collider for a particle physicist like me is a microscope. It lets us see and create and study the smallest building blocks of nature that we can summon now. And in many ways, it's also a time machine. In the same way that kind of getting your family together every year for a reunion is a way of seeing the history of your family laid out all in one moment, the Large Hadron Collider smashes together protons at such energies that it essentially recreates a moment in time 100, uh, about a hundred millionth of a millionth of a second after the creation of the universe. So this is a, a view inside the Large Hadron Collider Tunnel. It's 17 miles around. And what you're seeing here are one of 1,200 of the most powerful magnets that humankind has ever constructed. And their sole purpose is to keep um, something of the order of several hundred trillion protons going around in a big circle. Now, that doesn't sound very impressive. But the idea is to get them up to within about 8 miles per hour of the speed of light and then try to smash them together. 100 trillion protons on another 100 trillion protons. In the hopes that one or a dozen or maybe 45 of those pairs of protons will smash into each other and annihilate one another. And the resulting fireball is a little bang. It's a little burst of energy that represents a moment in time, a hundred millionth of a millionth of a second after the beginning of time. And if we can photograph those moments in time, we can build up a family photo history of what the universe was like when no human eyes were there to see it in the hopes of understanding what were the building blocks and the forces that were playing the dominant role at the time the Large Hadron Collider can recreate. Well, you need a camera. If you're going to take pictures, you need a camera. And this is my camera. Well, so sorry, it's not my camera. I mean, I share it with 3,000 other people. There's only really one like it in the world. I mean, technically, there are two big multi-purpose cameras at the Large Hadron Collider, but Atlas is unique in its scale. It is eight stories tall. It is half a football field in length. And unlike the mobile phone camera that can be stamped out of a factory like a toaster for you to buy on a payment plan from a telecommunications company, you know, that thing can maybe take 240 pictures per second of high definition quality video with, you know, pixel resolutions of up to maybe 12 million pixels. The Atlas camera, in contrast, is a 100 million pixel camera take, capable of taking 40 million pictures per second. That's an incredible achievement, and that's why there's really only one or two things like it in the entire world. And this thing has to run nine to 10 months out of the year, 24 hours a day while the Large Hadron Collider is operating, and it's gonna do that over something like 20 to 25 years. So this thing has to work, and it has to work all the time and really well. And that's why it takes a huge group of people, not only to make it happen, but to keep it going and make it better. All right, well, this is an example of one of the photographs that we you know, study. We don't do it this way. We don't do it with our eyes. We write computer programs that break this down into things physicists can talk about, like energy and momentum. And we build up a picture by all the stuff that sprays into the camera we work back to the center where the proton-proton collision happened and we try to figure out what stuff was made at the moment of the collision. And is it stuff we've never seen before that's so rare that you'd only lay eyes on it with enough energy and enough proton-proton collisions every second? This happens to be a photograph of a very good candidate for a Higgs boson. It has evaporated, its energy, its mass energy has converted into other things. Those are the things we see. But thanks to hundreds of years of understanding nature using the laws of physics, we can work back to what happened at the center where the protons collided. Now, we don't keep 40 million pictures per second. Do you keep every photograph that you take? I mean, for instance, here the photographer was clearly trying to get a lovely photo of these three friends or family members or something like this. And this idiot jumped in and photobombed it at the last minute. We all have a cousin or a best friend who does this sort of thing, right? Um, 
In many ways, all the physics that we already discovered, all the particles we already know about, the low-hanging fruit, in hindsight, that was easy to discover, that's the stuff the Large Hadron Collider makes all the time. When you smash two protons together, you get the whole record of all the easy discoveries you ever made before, and buried somewhere in there are the new ones you're really hoping to find. And so we don't keep every picture either. We whittle down 40 million photos per second to maybe a few hundred interesting ones per second that then get distributed all across the globe and analyzed by physicists looking for various things, including you know, more information about the Higgs boson. So if you had asked me uh, you know, about three years ago, what did I think as an experimental scientist the family photo looked like for stuff you could go into the lab and run the reunion and reliably study, I would have shown you a picture like this, much like the ones that you've seen earlier tonight. There are the quarks and the leptons, and as was said uh, by Dr. Jackson in the previous talk, all you need are the ups and the down quarks and the electrons to make all the atoms that make us up. All this other stuff played a much more important role near the beginning of time, and without it, we, the universe wouldn't be the way it is today. So even though we're, they're not very common things you run into, like charm quarks and top quarks and things like that, they're essential in why the universe turned out the way it did. And as far as we know, there are four forces. Three of them we can describe as being carried by particles, and that pesky gravity problem is a real challenge to physics that everyone says will be solved in 20 years, and we'll see what happens in 20 years. And there was a rumor, right? There's like a story in the family. Uh, there was a rumor that there's another particle out there. You need it in order to give mass, to give substance to all the other things that have mass or have substance. And that thing, that rumored thing, was the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle. So it's like, you know, great, 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 great Uncle Peter, who's rumored to exist, but no one can find a family photo of this guy. And then one day, you happen to go through enough photo albums and you find some person you've never seen before in a family picture. And that's essentially what happened in 2012, when the Atlas collaboration and the CMS collaboration co-announced the discovery of a new particle. It took a whole other year of work just to nail down its properties enough to be convinced that it's probably very likely the Higgs boson. So as a result of the mathematical work that they did with colleagues in the 1960s, Francois Anglaire and Peter Higgs, so great, 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 great uncle Peter, I guess, over here, they received and shared the Nobel Prize in 2013 for their essential contributions that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. They did their work in the early 1960s. That's a long road to travel. So if you were to ask me what I think the family photograph looks like, I would, I would say, okay, it's not a rumor anymore. I really think the evidence says that the Higgs boson is a real thing. And we've only just barely begun to scratch the surface at understanding this particle and its role in the great family photo. So if you heard about great, 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 great Uncle Peter and then stumbled across one photograph of this person, would you be satisfied just knowing the, what the person looked like and then be done with your quest to understand this family member? Would anyone in here be satisfied? No, probably not. You'd probably take that picture and go from family member to family member and do more work. You want to understand who, who was um, great, 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 great Uncle Peter. When did they live? But what did they do? Why, why does nobody really seem to know what their life was like? Is this a whole other branch of the family that we would like to understand more to understand our rich family history? And so I would, I would say that my biggest hope is that as we continue to study the Higgs particle, uh, now that the Large Hadron Collider has gone through a, an upgrade and we're going to get even more collisions at a higher energy than we've ever had before, uh, we'll not only make lots more Higgses, but we'll be able to, dis to really discern their exact properties with much more clarity than we could from the first two years of data that we had from the Large Hadron Collider. This is a multi-decade program to understand this particle that now in many ways sits at the center of the focus of our family photo. My hope as a physicist is that it won't just be the Higgs particle that we study alone. I hope that there'll be a whole bunch of other things, maybe relatives of the Higgs particle, heavier than Higgs that are weird or strange in some way, compared to the one predicted by the standard model of particle physics. Dark matter's got to get mass from someplace if it has mass, and it doesn't get it from the standard model Higgs particle. So I'm hoping that we'll find a whole new family tree, a whole new branch of the family tree that tells us about where mass comes from for things outside of the standard model of particle physics. And so my big hope that I'll leave with you tonight is that all of us retain the curiosity that we had as children 
And we use the life experiences that we go through to develop in a particular path that's of most interest to us. I became passionate about physics and understanding physics in 1991 through a series of events, including, oddly enough, the death of Papa. That was one thing that set me on the path to being a physicist. But one thing that's essential to never lose is the curiosity that drives you to ask questions, do the hard work to try to get the answers, and then actually have the hubris to expect answers to come to you at some point from the universe. That's how you make discoveries, and that's what all of you should go out tonight and try to do. Ask questions and go find the answers. That's what life is all about. So thank you very much. great story about discovery. So we had quite a few good talks tonight and they were about uh, these interesting questions about the future of physics. So I hope in coming years we will be able to answer some of these questions. So I'd like to invite all of our speakers tonight to come back up on stage please. <coughs> We would like to, uh, let's thank our speakers again for talking to us today. And we have... We have a few presentations to, to make, this so... Is uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of photobombing, that's true. <laughs> right on cue, so... Take a picture. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Eisen. Thank you. And, uh, I'm probably going to get paid for this job. Uh, <laughs> wow. Oh, wow, that's it. Oh, it's light. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> This is what happens when we let the chair of the physics department get involved. And uh, also, we have to thank you for your thank you. Matthew. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you for coming here, everybody. And I hope you have a safe journey home. And thanks to our brave MCs for hosting this evening as well. <laughs> The four speakers will be available for questions in the Centennial Hall in a minute or two. So.